What I want to talk about today, for the benefit of people, whoever they are seeing this video, is an introduction to the ideas in the 21st Century Learning Initiative. And I'm summarizing it by referring to this particular presentation as being overschooled but undereducated. Have we got the balance right? My youngest son, who was about eight or nine at the time, was holding my hand. This was pre pre adolescent days. And he looked up at me and said, Daddy, how do little children learn to talk? And I thought this was such a fascinating question. I sort of delayed a split second too long as I collected my thoughts as to how to answer him. And he looked up at me and said, Daddy, I think that's a pretty simple question. I bet you're not going to give me a long and complicated answer. <laughs> and so what I want to do and what really my mission within the 21st Century Learning Initiative is to focus on, you know, what are the essentials of human learning? Because you don't have to be a, a real brain to realize, of course, the human species is an incredible learning species. The one thing that separates us from any other species on the Earth's planet is our extraordinary ability to learn. And here we have Confucius two and a half thousand years ago saying something which is as true now as it was then. We have brains that are very inquisitive. We have brains that grow through use. And we have brains which progressively from the day we're born right through as we get older and older are designed, have evolved to make sure that we are ever more masters or mistresses of our environment. We want to make sense of things. I'm told that the brain receives over a million pieces of information every second. And we have to have magnificent crap detectors to get rid of those things we don't actually need to hear and see. And if you think of your very youngest children, your own personal children, there's endless questions when they're about three or four, why, how, what, and you give them an answer and five minutes later they come back with the same question. And it goes on and on and on. Why? Because you see, the brain has evolved not just to take on board the wisdom of other people. Actually, the brain is suspicious of the wisdom of other people. What it actually wants to do is to make its own sense of what is going on. So simply to tell people our answer is actually not to get deep into the brain, they forget it. So if you imagine going back to those days when you had got little children around and you, you were not quite so busy that you actually took time out and you showed the child the answer to the question, then almost instantly the child tries to push you out of the way and say, well, get out of my way, let me do it, let me experiment with it, let me try and do it for myself. And that's what our ancestors, you know, have been doing for probably seven million years, whatever the figure is, we're not quite sure, but for a very, very long time. And the whole essence of what I'm going to be talking about is that our brains have evolved to meet the challenges of the environment. If it really is seven million years since we parted company with the great apes, that is actually half a million generations. And you all know the principles of evolution, and that is that those mutations that occur from generation to generation which are most advantageous are the ones, those slight changes, which over the course of time become part of the human genome. So what we're born with, if you like, are the successful conclusions of half a million people trying to work things out in sequence over seven million years. And most people are going to be watching this video are going to be concerned with schools and wherever I go around the world, schools, particularly secondary schools, are in difficulty. And I wonder how many people think they could identify this glorious statement on the screen. I, I must tell you, it doesn't come from Canada in the 21st century. It doesn't come from England in the 20th century. It's far older than that. It's from a man in Rome in the year 325. A man who once prayed, Lord, make me good, but not just yet. And some of you will equipped St. Augustine in the confessions of written when he was older in about 350, 360. Oh my God, how I suffered. I was beaten because I didn't understand what was going on and nobody bothered to explain it to me. I'll give you a second one. This one does actually come from, from Canada. You may or may not be proud to know. I was at a conference in 19, sorry, in about 2003, 
of 200 teachers in Toronto, and in advance they decided to invite 10% uh, of high school students to join them. So there were 200 teachers and 20 senior high school students. And after a very full and very fascinating discussion, one 15-year-old got up with most enormous confidence and said, I don't want to insult you. Please don't think I'm being rude, but do you realize how boring it all is? And she went on and said that. And then somebody else, another youngster, got up and said, you know, it's almost as if you're treating education like a pre-cooked television dinner. All you have to do is take it out of the refrigerator, put it into the microwave, press the button, and out it comes. We'd actually be more interested in trying to work out what we were going to cook. You almost make it too easy for us. Now, in between giving endless lectures, I'm in the process of writing another book at the moment. When you're writing books and you're trying to trace out where all these ideas come from, you inevitably have to do a lot of research. And about three or four months ago, I discovered a footnote in another book to an essay written by Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. This was an essay on education written by Aldous Huxley uh, five years before he published Brave New World. And there's something so incredibly significant to what he says in that essay, and it goes over two slides, and I'm going to use valuable time just to take you through this. 1927, 80 years ago. Hitherto, we've been considering the uninspired teacher who works his or her way dully and mechanically through the prescribed curriculum. But teachers may be, and frequently are, charming, intelligent, and persuasive. They may put things well. They may speak in a way that will command attention and awake emotion and enthusiasm. They may have a power of making difficulties seem easy. The child will listen to such teachers and will greatly appreciate them, particularly if he has an examination to pass in the near future. Now, this is the key part. But the more accomplished a teacher is in the art of lecturing or coaching, the worse he is in the, as an educator. Working on the old-fashioned system, the clever teacher, deplorable paradox, does almost more harm than the stupid one. For the clever schoolmaster makes things too easy for his pupils. He relieves them of the necessity of finding out things for themselves. By dint of brilliant teaching, he succeeds in almost eliminating the learning process. He knows how to fill his pupils with ready-made knowledge, which they inevitably forget, since it's not their knowledge and costs them very little to acquire, as soon as the examination for which it was required is safely passed. The stupid teacher, and please excuse Aldous Huxley's description of people like this, the stupid teacher, on the other hand, may be so completely intolerable that the child would perhaps be driven, despairingly and in mere self-defense, to educate himself in which case the incompetent shepherd will have done all unwittingly a great service to his charge by forcing him into a rebellious intellectual independence. I don't know about you, but I find those words really pretty haunting. There's something fascinating about the way that is set out because we all try and be the very best teachers that we can, but sometimes we forget that dictum of primary education which says if a child asks a good question, don't be in a hurry to answer it. Don't answer it, reverse it with another question because the probability is that the child has almost worked out the answer already if they've asked the good question. Those of you who are students of the classics will know this is almost exactly what Aristotle said two and a half thousand years ago. Build it up on the basis of a question and a question and a question. And those of you who have studied education in the last 30 or 40 years will know it's pure constructivism. We move forward because we are trying constantly to upgrade the models in our own minds. And of course, no two brains work in the same way. And every one of us has a brain that we've inherited through the intellectual experiences of our ancestors passed down through, us, through the human genome. And they're all about making our own sense. And recently in Australia, um, I was working with a group of young people, and I asked them to list what they thought were some of the most powerful learning experiences that they could think of. And here's what they said in the Antipodes. Watching the dawn of the day. Glorious first name, isn't it? First list. 
do we have enough experience of the sheer wonder of what's around us? Observing the ebb and flow of the tide, now I realize that in some parts of Canada your rivers have been dammed up so you can't see the tide going up and down, but the sheer wonder of the ice which is there in wintertime and the lovely sailing weather that is there in the summer and the shape of the waves. The sheer wonder, quadratic equations may not appeal to everybody, but trying to work out why the waves are doing what they are is an application of quadratic equations, the different ways in which we think about things. Or the sheer beauty of the opening of a flower. You know how many people now set their cameras on 15-minute 15, 15 exposures over the course of a day and, and watch hyacinths coming out at this stage of the year. We've got one in our home in England at the moment. I think it's done its whole life cycle in about 24 hours. You can almost see it changing. And it's wondrous and it prompts so many other questions. Or the study of strength and fragility, of conformity and protest, permanence and transience. Is that at the heart of the education systems of the people looking at this video? Is that at the heart of challenging people to find out what's around them and start drawing conclusions? Because the human brain is there to make sense and we immediately want to make sense of the land and the environment that we're in because deep down each one of us knows that we'll only survive if we make enough good decisions to take us through to the next step. Now, the 21st Century Learning Initiative, which you in Canada are now setting up your own parallel structure for, which we're talking about today, our original purpose statement is quite interesting. It's to facilitate the emergence of new approaches to learning that draw upon a range of insights into the human brain. It's only one part of it. The functioning of human societies. So it is very much to do with community. It's very much to do with anthropology. It's to do with sociology. It's the act of learning as a self-organizing activity. It's the fact that the way we learn, we create structures which we then have to use. We build our houses and then live in them. If we get it wrong, then we, we haven't got much room to move. And why are we doing it? To release human potential in ways that nurture and form democratic communities worldwide that will help reclaim and sustain a world supportive of human endeavor. We're inspired by the need to ensure that the world continues for the benefit of our children and our children's children's children and is not fouled up by us becoming too technologically clever for our own philosophic boots, I suppose. Do we know what we're doing with the wisdom that's coming along? And so we often talk within the initiative as education in terms of a definition that Vaclav Havel, the former president of the Czech Republic, had, glorious dissident who spent most of his life locked up by the communists writing plays and then unfortunately smoking too much. Um, education is the ability to perceive the hidden connections between phenomena. That's a definition we like. It's the ability to see the things that aren't immediately obvious. In England years ago we had a toilet cleaner called Harpic and it used to be advertised as going clean round the bend. Harpic was the thing that cleaned around the S bend, the bit you didn't see. We like to think of education as being a bit like a Harpic, I suppose. It actually gets the places that aren't normally looked at. And that inspires them, that cleans them out, everything functions properly. Now, the reason the initiative came into being when it did was that over the last 40 years or so, there's been an absolutely phenomenal development in our understanding about how the human brain works. When I started studying to be a teacher some 40 years ago, our courses at university were much about philosophy, a certain amount about pedagogy, a certain amount about subjects. Nobody ever mentioned the brain. As far as psychology was concerned, it was pure behaviorism. The very first note in my notebook says, um, animals have instincts, humans have learned behaviors. There was nothing in the brain, as far as we were taught 40 years ago, that wasn't put there by some form of learning experience. The brain was still Descartes' blank slate. And we need to understand this. One of the main reasons for that problem goes back to 1859, when Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species. And The Origin of Species, as you know, of course, argued that the human is a, a work in progress, that we are constantly evolving 
The medical profession seized on the idea of evolution uh, because it helped them to make sense of things they didn't understand. They know, as you know, that the bits of your body that really you just don't need any longer, and they've been around for a hell of a long time. Those of you sitting watching this video, if you're sitting uncomfortably on a hard chair, it's because your cock sticks has got in the way, that last vertebrae at the back of the spine, which we haven't needed for a long, long time. Those of you who had your appendix cut out will have been told by the surgeon, it doesn't matter. You're not eating enough grass to merit having an appendix. And we haven't been eating enough grass, they think, for about <laughs> 200,000 years. And the same goes for the gallbladder and all the rest of it. And if you're suffering from weak backs, as I'm afraid many of people watching this will do, it's because actually we still haven't come to terms with work, walking upright. We are changing all the time. Now, medical science leapt at that. And they said, well, this is an overriding thesis into which we can put other things. And they put genetics and they put all kinds of other things as time's gone by. But um, psychology looked at the theory of evolution and said, no way. We can't conceive of the idea that the brain is anything other than always the same. And you, in a way, have to be sympathetic to them because in 1859, there was no way of studying how the brain worked. It was just a sort of three and a half pound mass of rather unappetizing cold porridge stuck inside a brain. And if you cut it out, it looked even less attractive. And so the theory grew up that actually the brain was just a mechanism. And that's how behaviorism came to thrive. And then you look at the, um, the disciplines that have followed from behaviorism. First of all, you think of cognitive science, which grew up in the late 50s, early 60s. A very mathematical discipline uh, stimulated by the computer industry who were very interested in discovering how the human brain worked to see if they could model that in a computer. And it's about inputs and outputs. And you measure the quality of the output in comparison to the input. Some education systems around the world, I'm sure not in Canada, are still working on a very cognitive science model. Input, output, how effective is the brain? And in the 1940s in England, we said that effectiveness is those who are intelligent have got it and those that haven't, haven't. Then in the 1970s, early 80s, neurobiology, discovering PET scans, CAT scans, functional MRI, developed the ability to film the inside of the brain through simply putting a scan on somebody's head non-invasive technology. And as they were talking to people, they could see which part of the brain lit up and which didn't, and that was intriguing. And then in the last 15 years, a whole series of other subjects have started to come together, loosely called evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary studies, anthropology, genetics, polymer analysis, systems theory, and all the rest of it, using all kinds of extraordinary technologies which are just only suddenly coming onto the, onto the market. Even in today's newspaper, uh, there was an item which said that uh, a paper was published earlier on this month to show that three and a half million um, Jews can all go back to three ancestral mother figures that left um, central Palestine about 1,200 years ago. The amount of material now becoming possible through um, a variety of genetic studies, in particular mitochondria studies, and then the one which is just beginning to break, if you haven't heard of this yet, it's epigenetics. The suggestion that cultural affairs can have such a devastating effect on one person that that turns off the appropriate genes for three or four generations on from now. And therefore, something that happens culturally to a great-great-grandparent, they're now being able to show in Sweden, affects the life expectancy of the great-great-great-grandchild. And one of the things that's beginning to be fed into that is the concept that clinical depression, if it's there in both the parent and the grandparent, then is transmitted as a probability at about 30 to 40% to the grandchild. If it's there in three generations, that goes up to a 50% probability. If it's there in four generations, it goes up to a 70% probability. And the most successful time of impacting on that clinical depression is before the child first experiences it, before they go into, into puberty. Now, as school systems around the world try to come to terms with the medical implications of that, we've got a lot of learning to do ourselves. But if you take all those disciplines, you then have to realize that what we're talking about is that we have a human race which is not a blank slate, which does, in each and every one of us, have a direct history. 
And just as when you were in earliest years of high school and you were studying basic biology, you were told if you took a mother with blue eyes and a father with green eyes, what were the probability of having children with blue eyes, green eyes, or mixed right eyes? How does the recessive gene work down through the generations? We know that we look as we look because of our ancestors. We also know that we look as we look because of the lifestyle that we've adopted. We reckon there are at least six interrelated issues that need to be synthesized and drawn together. And it's very easy to get sidetracked on just taking one and not the other. Yes, of course, there is the biological nature of learning. Then there is the cultural aspect of that, the science of learning. How have we dealt with these factors in the past, even if we didn't fully understand them? Because we condition the way we use our brain by the, if you like, the epistemology that we've adopted, the construction of knowledge. Then uh, there is this massive implication of the way in which culture is changing the priorities that we place on education systems. Moving from the education of the whole man towards the delights of a free market. Maybe I should put the word delights in an inverted commas. Go-go capitalism, if you like, and on to globalization. And then there's the impact of the new technology. How does that extend our thinking process? And then there's the whole nature of the home and community. And then the biggest of all questions, what is the value system that we're running with? Exactly what are we educating people for? And here in Canada, I'm sure you haven't lost the distinction between battery hens and free-range chickens. The difficulty that education faces is that if you look at education from an accountancy type point of view, how you're going to get the best return on the money, it's all too easy to fall into the battery hen model. You think you know what your outcomes are going to be, so you put your chickens into wire cages and you feed them the correct amount of food and whatever, and as far as the accountant is concerned, you get very good return on your money because you don't waste any spare energy on developing legs or wings. But if you haven't got the shape of that system right and you take that wire cage away, that chicken can hardly stand on its own feet, and it's a perfect morsel for a predatory fox to take around. So I want to spend this presentation simply on looking at the major issue of the brain and the impact that is having on learning. One of the things that has become very clear in the last 15 to 20 years is that there are three periods in a life cycle when the brain goes through spontaneous spring cleaning. And if any of you men in the audience are aware of what happens to all your dearly loved belongings when the rest of the family starts spring cleaning, you can never find anything again. And I'm sure it happens on both sides of the sexual divide. Spring cleaning is good, but it's also dangerous. You have to decide what you want to keep there and what you want to get rid of. Intriguingly, the first period of synaptogenesis in, is in the first six months of life. And large quantities of the brain the child is born with, the synapses, just disappear in that early stage. The second is adolescence, and I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on that. And the third, you just have to wait to come to one of the lectures on, it's what happens to the older brain. Now, that is a fascinating one, but it's not one I'm going to attempt to deal with today. Now, with all that stress on evolution, I think we've got to be very certain about another factor. Because years gone by, this was trivialized when people talked about nature versus nurture. As if it were one or the other in a continuous battle. I think one of the most interesting books of the last three years was Matthew Ridley's book, Nature via Nurture. And that summarizes just in three words this new understanding that actually we are not prisoners of our genes. It's the culture that we live through which either turns on or turns off the genes. In fact, to us humans, we only discover our full humanity if we're within a culture that draws that out. And you will all know certain stories, and they're even still coming through, where scientists have found children who have been brought up by animals. And there was one case in 2005 from Indonesia where they discovered two twins aged about, they thought, somewhere around the age of 10 that had been brought up by baboons in the forest. And those children were more like baboons than they were like humans. And at the age of 10, there was nothing that cognitive scientists could do with them to recover the fact that they hadn't had the cultural stimulant that is needed to produce humans. And you'll all have your own stories of thinking around your great country. 
where you know the cultural experience of some children is so, so weak that one fears for how much their potential is being lost. It's clearest in this lovely statement down here, learning is a delicate balance between the two. Clearest perhaps in the development of language. That glorious miracle when you watch a young child learn to speak their own native language without any form of formal instruction at all. But if that child hasn't heard any language spoken by about the age of three or four, it's going to have difficulties. If it hasn't heard any language spoken by the age of eight, probably the brain will have got rid of that part of the brain that handles language. And then you wonder what's happened to you when at the age of 13 or 14 or even older you're trying to learn another language. You've got no cultural, you've got no biological advantage in it. The brain has moved on to other things. It's a balance. Now, we're beginning to understand a lot more about the environment in which our ancestors lived over vast periods of time that have shaped the way that our brains do certain things. And one of the advantages of my job is I get invited to lecture in various places and several times I go to Africa and on one occasion I was given the extraordinary opportunity of being one of only two groups of people a year allowed by the Tanzanian government to go into a certain valley way up in the mountains where there is the remains of the Hadza tribe. There are only about 900 of them left and it's almost pure Stone Age condition. Their contact with civilization outside the area is virtually zero. They don't have any clothes, they don't have any crops, they don't plant anything, they don't build houses, they live entirely from hand to mouth. And they have a very deep culture. And I was intrigued when I was told I was going to have the chance of going and watching them. And I don't know how you would react, but it's sort of about a 14-hour Land Rover drive up through the mountain. As I got nearer and nearer, I thought, what do I do when I meet a person from the Stone Age? You know, how do you communicate with the Stone Age? Do you shake hands? And do you look embarrassed when you realize they haven't got any clothes on? And do they look embarrassed when they see that you're all dressed up? And when we came round a corner in one of the forest glades and there were three men with their bows and arrows and nothing else standing there, and we got out of the Land Rover and they walked slowly towards us. And I thought, now what happens? And they put their hands together like that and held their hands out to us to touch them. Well, that was just the beginning of the cultural experience, but as this is only an introduction, a couple of three things. I thought I'd try and follow the men as they went out hunting out on the savannah. They only stood about five foot high, lean, thin, fine figures. And I thought, well, you know, this is great. I'm six foot something or other. I can follow them. They lost me in 10 minutes flat. They strode out across the savannah with their bows and arrows. They separated. They didn't come back for 12 hours. They covered several hundred square miles in that time. They had the most wonderful sense of direction. And they had incredibly focused eyes they could follow the animals at great distance. And then I spent a day following the women. They were very different. They never stopped talking for a start. Uh, they set out with their babies on their backs, their aged relatives coming alongside with them. They appeared to have eyes in the back of their heads. They had little sticks about that long, no instruments at all. And with these sticks, they dug in the ground, they pulled out the tuber, the roots of various plants, which they threw onto a fire. That was their only cooking implement. They could see all the nuts and the berries and the honey, wherever it was. And within a couple of hours, they collected all the food that was needed to survive. The families didn't live on the food the men got. From day to day, their energy came from the food that the women got from the ground. Now, they think that our human existence has been about 98% of recognizable time we've been living like that. And here's something which you can use quite interestingly in school. It goes like this. We men have a very different structure to the back of our eye to the structure that you women have at the back of your eyes. We men have marvelous focused vision. We can't see anything to either side. You women haven't got very good focus vision. You've got brilliant peripheral vision. Basically, that means that you women see more things than men see. The latest research shows that women spend as much time looking at attractive men as men spend looking at attractive women. The only thing is that men have to turn their heads to do so. Women don't. <laughs> if anybody ever says to you, we have to reduce sexual differences, we've got to close the gender gap. Be careful with that one. 
because actually we have evolved to make the most of the gender gap. We men, this is very interesting when I'm dealing with audiences of young people, if you ever ask young people what they think, if you ask young girls what they think of boys' conversation, they immediately say it's boring. If you ask boys what they think of girls' conversation, then what the hell do they think to talk about all the time? You may think that as groups of adults. The evidence is that in the course of 24 hours, men formulate as many words in a 24-hour period as women do. But because men have been living on their own out on the prairie for 98% of time, actually five out of six words that men formulate during the course of a day, they never actually speak to anybody else. They only speak to themselves. And then you think about boys and girls in school. Some seem very guttural. Some seem very confident. With all of these sexual differences, you have to realize they're on a spectrum. And if you like, there is no such thing as a pure male and there's no such thing as a pure female. We're on spectrums. But the third thing that was so obvious about these people was the extraordinary care they gave to their children. And their education was, again, pure constructivism. It was pure, watch what I'm doing. Let me break that down into subtasks. Let me give you the skill with the subtask. Don't worry about the rest. Let's persevere with the subtask, but I'll always remind you of why, by shaping an arrow that way, when you're able to have a bow as well, you'll be able to fire it in a particular way, and constantly working step by step by step to make the youngster independent of the adult. And on one occasion, I had to come back through the forest by myself, and I was given a, a child who stood about so high to take me through. And it wasn't about 20 minutes into the forest, I realized I was totally and utterly dependent on that kid. And that kid was reading the forest with the skill that anyone in this country would read a book. He could understand the nature, the vibrations, the color on the trees and all the rest of it. It was pretty fantastic. So we're born with brains that expect to get out there and find it out for ourselves. Why? Well, I think the issue actually goes right back to the beginning of the big brain. And it's this. Every other mammal, apart from man, um, give birth to their young when their brains are at least 95% fully formed. From the moment that the human brain started to get bigger because we were using it to think more, we humans developed a problem. As the brain got bigger, the skull had to get bigger. As the skull got bigger, the woman's birth canal didn't get bigger. If you women were to carry our babies now until their brains were 95% fully formed, Pregnancy would last for 37 months, and the baby would never get down the birth canal. The last three months of pregnancy are the time when the human brain is more susceptible to external influence than any other stage in the entire life cycle. We've known for a long time that mothers who are on drugs or malnourished damage their fetus's brain. But only recently have we come to understand that women who are under unsustainable levels of stress during the last three months of pregnancy can damage the development of the fetus's brain by as much as two years of formal schooling is needed afterwards. So wherever you are in Canada, if you're thinking about the development of a, of a community-wide learning strategy, then in fact the care of mothers in the last three months of pregnancy is of critical importance. And so is the education that they get in what actually is going to matter as their children start to develop. For a long time, there's been evidence that breastfed children do better than non-breastfed children, and their intelligence grows quicker. And endless manufacturers of powdered milk have tried to work out what substances were missing in their milk, and it isn't substance. We've known for a long time that a young baby's eyes first focus at 13 inches. 13 inches is the average distance from the mother's eyes to the baby's eyes at the breast. Only in the last few years have they put functional MRI scans on a baby's, breast, oh, sorry, baby's head at that moment, and they find that there is a tenfold increase in synaptic activity in the baby's brain when the baby's eyes are bonding with the mother's eyes. Men can have the same effect with a, with a bottle, provided you don't do what I did, which was to read the newspaper at the same time. It seems that the first clue to intelligence is there in the first few weeks and months of life. And because we are creatures of our background, there is nothing we can do about it. 
The human brain, it's reckoned, takes 30,000 years for a significant change to occur in the way it works. We're still running, if you like, 21st century software on brains last updated 30,000 years ago. The baby is born expecting that. And so <clears throat> this solution from the United States recently of um, producing lactation support rooms for young employees to go into and have breast pumps attached to take their milk out and then to have motorbike outriders ready to whisk fresh mother's milk to some distant day nursery where the mother can watch her baby being fed her milk on closed circuit television. But the baby can't focus on the mother's eyes. That's incredibly important. One book which came out in 2004, which is a, a paperback, which is always nice, it means it expects to sell large numbers, is entitled Why Love Matters. And it takes this business of the very young brain only being 40% formed. In that 40% the baby's brain is born with the virtually no emotional connections hardwired. The emotional connections had to be formed in the first six to nine or at the most 12 months of life. And how are they formed? They're formed by doing the only thing the baby can do, modeling its emotional reactions on the emotions of the people around it. The child who lives with adults whose emotions are under control will develop similar emotions. The child who's living with parents whose emotions are off the wall will have off the wall emotions very, very quickly indeed. Now, 10 years ago, Gerald Edelman, who just got his second Nobel Prize for uh, his work on the human brain, and in particular, how learning occurs in the human brain, made this interesting analogy. He started likening the brain to a tropical rainforest. Now, I find that a, an intriguing way of thinking about it because a tree in the rainforest doesn't grow to 300 feet high because it's genetically prepared to do so. It's just that if it doesn't get there, it doesn't get to the sunlight. And Edelman's argument is that the brain is just like that. It's full of challenge. We rise to meet challenge. If we don't have enough challenge, the brain doesn't grow. And his argument, therefore, is that the sort of classroom environment we need to produce is something more like a rainforest with lots of different challenges. So if I draw this bit almost to a conclusion on the young brain, I'd like everybody to take a careful look at this graph hypothetical graph of human intellectual development, if you like, human weaning. Moving from the left to the right from just before birth to about the age of 20, with dependency below the line, autonomy above. Starting just before birth, the brain is like a dry sponge. It grows like a dry sponge in terms of the fact it can't but help learn from whatever's going on around it. It just picks it up naturally. And that peaks probably at about the age of three, four, or maybe as late as five. Why is that? In the environment we came from, the child had to learn incredibly fast in the first few years of life it was going to survive. But it learned without the benefit of a teacher. It learned just through interaction. And then we get this development of that line of human growth moving towards adolescence. And you'll see the word weaning put on it. Very basically, what is happening? What's the relationship between here and there? This is where you are dependent on people helping you, providing you with the environment to learn. This is where you have to do it for yourself. And that balance between the two is very, very important to hold. I call it human weaning. The whole message of the initiative is this, that teachers teaching in the traditional way are absolutely essential when children are very young. But as that child is getting older, the whole of its biological trends are saying, and they're not actually saying thank you very much for what you've already done to me. They don't even bother to say that. They're actually saying get out of my way and let me do a little bit more for myself and a little bit more and a little bit more. And of course, the reality is some of the work from San Diego is showing us is that the way we come to use our brains shapes the way that we can do it. So the adolescent that hasn't had the chance of actually taking responsibility for themselves is actually not going to grow the sort of brain later on that they need. And before I leave the issue of the very youngest children, it is important to take note of some of the warnings that are now coming out about some of the distractions to human brain growth. And television is undoubtedly one of them. Now, television, like computers, it's morally neutral, it's dependent on what you want to do with it. But in the wrong way, it can be quite destructive. 
And this research from 2004 in Seattle, a very large study on the impact of children and television. And their conclusion was that children below the age of two shouldn't watch television on the basis that the movement of the image was so fast that the child was mesmerized by the speed rather than by trying to analyze what the message was all about. And I'm sure many of you will be aware of it, but you'll be interpreting these into the figures you have for your own province. They were reckoning that the average American child below the age of four was watching three and a half hours of television a day. For every hour over the first hour, However, there was a statistical increase in the probability of attention deficit disorder by 10%. So a child on three and a half hours of television had a 25% chance of attention deficit problems. And I was talking recently with a group of young people in um, northern British Columbia, and the issue that was already worrying them as 17 or 18 year olds is for how long some of them had already been on Ritalin. And they were saying, and what are the long-term effects of this? Some of you may know a very interesting book which came out in 1999 from America, The Rise and Fall of the American Teenager. It's a glorious study. You could substitute the word American for British and you'd still have an absolutely exact book. I'm sure you could do it for Canadians as well. Modern society seems to have moved without skipping a beat from blaming our parents for the ills of society blaming our children. I must confess I'm part of that generation that we all went around blaming our parents for the screwed up world we were living in. And we were so well rebelled against it that maybe we no longer gave our children what they need. And now our children are wandering around wondering what earth is all about. Let me remind you historically of what happened just south of the Great Border from here. In the early 1930s, the majority of American 14-year-olds, something like 70%, were already in employment. And then there was the Great Depression. And Roosevelt hit on what he thought was the brilliant idea of saying, let's outlaw children below the age of 18 from having full-time jobs, and let's create high schools. And on one day, he passed the first bill to outlaw youngsters working full-time below the age of 18, and later that day, he passed another bill to authorize the training of half a million high school teachers and the capital program to extend high schools right across America, and, of course, he was lauded for what he was doing because he immediately put 7 million adult Americans back into work. But do we actually know what it's ideal for secondary schools to do? And are we expecting them to do things that actually their very structure prevents them from doing? Alex de Tocqueville, the, the French philosopher, spent a lot of time in America uh, in the 19th century, and he has a very interesting comment here. He basically said in America in the 1830s there was no adolescence. He used the word adolescence as the French used it. The French use of adolescence emerged in the mid 18th century. It was how they described the spoilt children of the aristocrats who had nothing to do. And they called them adolescents. Youngsters with money in their pockets and nothing to do. And he came to America and said, well, this is wonderful. There aren't any adolescents here. Adolescents are the driving force of society. It's on the sweat of the adolescent brow. It's their muscles that drives people through. And in a sense, those energetic youngsters are quite happy doing that. And this ties it back to what we're going to be looking at in the last part of this lecture, the way in which the human brain moves from being dependent on other people for instruction in adolescents who have a process known as cognitive apprenticeship to want to utilize their own learning to do things that they couldn't do beforehand. And I'm wanting to suggest, and people will have to come to a, a full course for me to expand on this in detail, that actually apprenticeship, not of the kind that we try to reinvent in the 21st century, but apprenticeship as was understood in the 19th century and for thousands of years before that, was in a sense a perfect response to the way in which the turmoil of the changing adolescent brain could be put to hard work, yes, but intellectually challenging work because adolescents working with a specialist were forever having to try and learn minute by minute from what a skilled person was doing. Now, I would put Thomas Jefferson into the same position as an apprentice as I would put Benjamin Franklin when he was learning how to work a printing press. 
everybody in the 19th, sorry, everybody in the 18th century and for years before that had to grow up because they were working with other people who knew more than they did and they had to learn that skill very, very quickly. Now the breakthrough in the studies on all this have occurred literally, I think, in the last five or six years and they are somewhat dramatized in a book called The Primal Brain in which they talk about the adolescent brain as being crazy by design. That's a nice twist around, isn't it? The adolescent brain is crazy by design. Now the research that, under, that packs this in is very interesting. The conventional wisdom still is that the young brain reaches adolescence, sorry, the young brain reaches adult structure by about the age of 12. And that adolescence is just crazy sex hormones getting in the way and sprouting a bit of extra hair and other bits and pieces and driving kids mad. The assumption has been the brain is still static. Well, a program that started four years ago in the States looking at 1,800 normal adolescents over a 10-year period, if you can imagine normal adolescence, the National Academy of Sciences have identified uh, 12, sorry, 1,800 youngsters at the age of 12 and they've all agreed to participate in a longitudinal study, which means that their brains will have a functional MRI scan every six months over a 10-year period. The first results of this are already beginning to come through, and they have shaken the neurological world quite rigid. Because all those lovely connections that you as parents and you as teachers try and create in children below about the age of 10 or 12, and you pride yourself on how well your child is doing, and you know they're a genius, and one day they're going to be even better than you, and you preen yourself, you take photographs of them, and you write them all about their achievements and your Christmas round robin letters and all the rest of it. You stop writing about that at about the age of 12 because they seem to have gone mad. They're throwing it all back in your face, and you can't begin to understand it. These functional MRI scans are beginning to explain it. About one or one and a half percent of all the dendrites that have been formed in their brains, and there are millions upon billions of these, about one, one and a half percent suddenly shatter each year for 10 years. And at the moment, we don't understand why. All the things that we've struggled to join together are being forced apart. And looking on a, on a scan, <laughs> You can actually see these sort of broken connections floating around in space. And somebody said at a lecture, that, God, you're just describing my daughter. You know, <laughs> everything's floating around and it isn't making sense any longer. Well, why? The teenage brain, far from being ready-made, is crazy by design. I want to unpack that. We wouldn't be who we are as humans if the things that drive our behavior weren't things that actually increased our chances of survival. <coughs> because the world has always been changing, very slowly maybe, for your child to grow up as a clone of you would actually be a pretty horrible thought because they would be equipped to deal with the world that you grew up in, not the world they're growing up in. And it's probably been like that since the beginning of time. To survive, they need to have mirrored you to start with, and then they need to have something going on inside them that prevents them carrying on mirroring you and deciding to do it for themselves. Adolescence is a very forceful pushing apart. Genetics would suggest that the, every one of us in this room, anybody watching this video, we're all related to people who moved out of Africa 60,000 years ago. 60,000 years ago is only about... 2,000 or 2,500 generations ago. And in 2,500 generations, we have covered the Earth's surface. On average, that means that each generation walked about three miles further than their parents. Now, this is a leap into the, you know, the distant past. Imagine yourself a 1,000 years after the trek out of Africa started. Your parents had moved into a clearing in the forest, a great sweat, they'd set fire to some trees around, they'd cleared the ground, they were scrubbing a living, and they were very proud they were scrubbing a living. You looked at them and thought, what a bloody awful existence they have. I'm going to climb that mountain over there and I'm going to go and find something better. And your parents said, don't be so mad, you don't know what's over the other side, you better stay here with us. And you went over the other side. As you went over the other side, you met somebody else who'd got the guts to say, I'm not going to stick around, I'm going to take a risk. 
and you mated and you settled down, you cleared another patch in the forest. Fifteen years later, your kids said to you, I'm not going to stick around here any longer, it's too awful, and you moved on. 60,000 years is not very long for a genetic mutation to shape the nature of the human brain. But look at this. There were no modern humans living outside Africa until 60,000 years ago. Our distant ancestors reached India 50,000 years ago, Thailand 40,000 years ago, Northern Europe 25,000 years ago. They got down to Tuadro Frego 10,000 years ago. And probably the ancestors of native Canadians got here between 15 and 20,000 years ago across the Bering Straits. When we left, this is the sort of the real chilly part going down the spine. When we left Africa, we were genetically ourselves. We had a language, we spoke. Imagine this. One group of people moved out across India, across Mongolia, to the Bering Straits, and crossed into Canada. Another group of people moved north through Europe, to Britain, to France. Three or four hundred years ago, they caught ships. They sailed across the Atlantic. They started walking across Canada. And somewhere in the middle of the prairies, after 60,000 years of separation, a European-based set of genes met a Canadian-Mongolian set of genes. They copulated, and six, nine months later, there was a perfect child. There was no change in 60,000 years in the genetic structure that the two sides brought together. Yet, 200 years ago, cultural change was so swift that we were already speaking 18,000 different languages. We'd grown from one language to 18,000 through the use of our brains, but the whole of our human structure was exactly the same. Now, I find that sort of a chilling and very exciting thought that we are who we are because we have an immense history. And I think adolescence is an absolutely critical part of just that. Because from the earliest times, the progression from being a dependent child to being an autonomous adult is the thing that's driven every society. And maybe this business of being crazy by design, and this is sort of adolescence going from about the age of 12, 13 to 21, 22, 24, sort of eight or 10 year period. That period of being prepared to take risks, being prepared to do things that sanity says you shouldn't do, is actually the energy that has driven human society. It's forcing young people in every generation to think beyond their own self-imposed limitations and exceed their parents' aspirations. The neurological changes in the young brain as it transforms itself means that adolescents have evolved to be apprentice-like learners, not evolved to be pupils sitting at a desk in the way in which they can comfortably do in the first 10 or 12 years of life. Now, you will also know that with any um, predisposition, you use it or you lose it. If you don't develop the ability to use the language skills by the age of seven or eight, you lose that capability. If you don't develop musical skills at certain stages, it's going to be much more difficult to do it later on. I have a feeling that this, dare I say it, bloody mindedness that we associate with adolescence is actually a window of opportunity, which if we don't let them develop it, disappears in their early, late teenage years, early 20s. And I don't know if, my having said this, if you then can go out on the street and sort of fresh eyesight, look around, this world is full of a large number of dependent adults who are frightened of taking risks and are frightened of going out on their own. And I think that is because we have damaged them. I think it's because over the last 100 years, we have literally been conned into the thought that was there in America in the late 19th century that said, adolescents are so vulnerable, we mustn't let them have contact with other people. We've got to shut them up and give them simulated experience. Now, that Western model of saying, gosh, there's so much, quote, to learn, we've got to keep them sitting down with their nose to the grinding stone because they've got so much to learn. And by the way, they mustn't be able to go and take risks, otherwise they're going to hurt themselves. That has been transported all the way around the world. And by one of those incredible coincidences, when I was in Angola um, giving a lecture on this, one of the teachers that evening went onto the website and he actually came from Tokyo, from uh, South Korea, only to discover that that day, the leading article in the major newspaper in South Korea 
The country that OECD are now saying is doing so well because o um, South Korea is now only a couple of three points behind Finland. So everybody said, you must now go and copy what they're doing in South Korea. An increasing number of people fed up with standardized education. Highly educated and professional parents lead the trend in the children of academics, teachers, doctors, substantial proportion of people to alternative schools. I've always wondered if children are happy within the boundaries of formal education, said Professor Lee Jae Woo. If children get a standardized education like battery chickens, they can't develop their own personalities and thus make themselves unhappy. I don't think I can necessarily claim I was in, to in um, Seoul two years ago giving the lecture on battery hens and free range chickens. Whether he was there at that time, I don't know. But if children get a standardized education like battery chickens, they don't develop their own personalities and make themselves unhappy. And then going down to the bottom, Dr. Chung Young Sun said, given the current situation where public education has been degraded to a system incapable of bringing any intellectual or emotional stimulus to students, we should expand and diversify alternative education programs so they can turn and change uh, the direction of our public education. Now that's coming from the country which has, in a sense, driven the OECD prescription about as hard as it can. I am talking about thinking about how the whole of particularly secondary education, but that means seeing it from the very beginning of primary education, is about weaning the child of their dependence on instruction and giving them such a good experience in the earliest years of life that the further on they go through the system, the more they are wanting a craftsman apprenticeship type role with their teacher rather than a pupil instructor role. And you all know about the various stages set out by um, Vygotsky 50, 60 years ago in saying the absolute essence of traditional learning systems is how the instructor models what is going on and having modeled what is going on then provides the sub-learning experiences and then only provides scaffolding. They don't provide continuous instruction. Rather as if you were a do-it-yourself expert, you, um, you want to build a wall, you keep scaffolding there as long as the cement is setting. If you had to keep the scaffolding there any longer, then in fact the wall isn't good enough, the scaffolding. And then it's the fading. This is critical in a whole apprenticeship model. If anybody was ever educated in that way, you'll know that the older you get, the more the craft master is saying, I'm going to leave you to work that problem out for yourself. You one day had to be as good as I am. And you will only get there if you are not dependent on going and ask somebody else for the answer to the questions. Uh, the whole idea of fading is to enable, as the old expression in friendship used to be, Jack is as good as its master. Jack is now ready to be the journeyman who can go out and earn his or her own living because they have absorbed all the theoretical and intuitive understandings of their teachers. They're not being, quote, taught, they've been tutored. And I think this concept of cognitive apprenticeship, tutoring, is utterly critical. Recently I was addressing a group of 42 um, young people for 12 hours up in, in northern British Columbia and the discussion that they had on this was absolutely fascinating. Their biggest complaint was they were still being treated, they said, as babies when they were 16 or 17. But the life they were having to live as self-autonomous adults outside school in a very rough environment where society seems to be breaking down meant that as Socially, they were much more mature than they had ever been before, but the school wasn't moving that form of maturity forward. And so I'm wanting to propose to you something really pretty dramatic. And you can only take this as a guideline, but when you look at the way the Western education system developed over the last 300 years, it was very much on a basis of Queen Victoria, <coughs> who said little children should be seen and not heard. And it was the same in Germany and the same everywhere else around the world. We didn't think little children mattered very much. And only as they got older did we spend more money on them. And only as they became about 14 or 15 did we think that we have decent conversations with them. And a Western model of education puts secondary education as being more significant than primary education. And it's funded it in most countries at a higher level. And that has tended to mean that the older the pupils are, the smaller their class sizes become. So there's an upside-down nature to that. 
there's an inside-out nature to that. Because progressively, from the early 19th century onwards, we've seen learning as being synonymous with schooling. And we've seen that the things which we think matter are the things that are delivered in a classroom or within the organization of an institution. And we've forgotten that actually, as far as a child is concerned, a child doesn't turn its brain on when it goes into school and off again when it comes out. It's probably turning it the other way around. And that wherever you go in the Western world, you will not find children between the ages of 5 and 18 that spend more than 20% of their waking hours in total in a classroom, or more than 25% of their waking hours in school. And the pressures of the industrial society we're living in, and they're getting worse and worse, are saying, God, we can't rely on parents or anybody else to do anything any longer. The school has to do it all. I'm wanting to suggest what I refer to as intellectual weaning. I'm wanting to say, let's challenge that upside down, inside out business. And let's work on a pedagogic principle that I refer to as subsidiarity. It's actually a Catholic doctrine of rather strange nature. What it says is very simple. It is wrong for a superior to hold to itself the right of making a decision for which an inferior is already qualified to do for itself. In other words, as soon as somebody is able to do it, they should do it. Now that is a terrific challenge right across the academic world. Even to those people listening to this uh, video who see themselves as being classroom teachers who are not allowed the autonomy they think they need because the superintendent says, I know a better way that you should do it and here's <coughs> the way you should do it. And I know of very many superintendents who feel that they are trapped in subsidiarity because their trustees are telling them you've got to do it this way, not the other way, even though this, uh, the superintendent knows more about it. And I'm sure deputy ministers and ministers know all the lot at bay in the same sort of issue. We are full of a society that tells other people what to do. If we're going to face the challenges of the 21st century, it's only going to be because we've learned how to make democracy work. And so a principle that I adopted in Britain is now being taken up with lots of challenging statements elsewhere. Why not reverse it? What about taking the total amount of money spent on education from K to 12 and devising it on a pupil-teacher ratio of saying the class size should never be more than twice the chronological age? And there's something to get people in Canada to talk about. Classes of 10 at the age of 5. 20 at the age of 10. Does that mean classes of 36 at the age of 18? I think not. I really think not. Because actually, if we do it properly from the very beginning, isn't it stupid to think that by the age of 18, everything that still has to be learned has to be taught in a classroom? What about doing this and getting to the stage that by the age of 16, 17, only half of what has to be taught is actually to, has to be learned is actually physically taught? And how about an environment where, in fact, secondary education means spending maybe half your amount of time in a building called school and half of your period of time with tutors who are not school tutors but are community tutors? People who are helping you. This is a challenge to the entire society. People who understand that we'll only come to adulthood if youngsters understand what adulthood means long before they leave school. Now, it's a very challenging argument. I frequently get challenged at every possible level in this, and one of our recent British Prime Ministers tried to challenge me on this. And at the end of an hour and a half, the man summarizing the document said, well, I have to say, much to my surprise, I can't really fault your argument. You're probably educationally right and ethically correct. But the system you're arguing for would require very good teachers. We're not convinced there will ever be enough good teachers, so instead, we're going for a teacher-proof system of organizing schools. That way, we can get a uniform standard. Now, I give this lecture in many countries. I'm sure there's nobody in Canada who would ever fall into that trap. And you need to broaden that one and say, not only do you need very good teachers, it would need a community that had a much bigger view of its future existence and the quality of what children would be all about. I'd want you to bear in mind, as you think about the children in your schools, the increase in mental tension in society, a tenfold increase in clinical depression over the last 60 years. Is the curriculum that we have offered in the past a curriculum simply about consumption as if everything can continuously grow in the present way? Or are you beginning to offer a curriculum that is about human, ecological, social, and spiritual sustainability? Because there are decisions to make. 
we're not blind. If anybody remembers the book by Fritz Schumacher, remember? Econo Small is Beautiful, Economics as If People Mattered. Book of the early 1970s. It comes from this. And Schumacher, like any other thoughtful person, says, actually, we can only be conned into doing what we're doing. We can stop ourselves being conned if enough people ask the right questions. We're not blind. We've got eyes and brains. We don't have to be driven hither and thither by the blind workings of the market, of history or of progress or of any other abstraction. We can think for ourselves. I was tempted the other day to think I'd write an, another book, Education as if People Mattered. Education at a child-centered, childlike scale, as if people mattered. So I want to end it with that and just give you my last thought. And this isn't because I'm doing this in Canada, but wherever in the world I try and sum up the initiative's thinking, I conclude with what I think is an ethical guideline that comes from your country. Uh, Chief Seattle, I believe, if there was such a person. Uh, but it's wonderful. We have not inherited this world from our parents. We've been loaned it by our children. I hope this will start people wanting to ask more questions. Thank you. In the months that have passed since the making of this videotape, it's obvious from a number of factors in different parts of the world that this situation that we're talking about, this potential collapse of the world around us, is growing all the time. We've actually got to wake up to the reality that we're fouling up not only the ecosystem around us, we're wasting the potential of the human brain. It's as if we've forgotten that both of them are interactive. And we may not have very long to get that right. And if we don't, then the lights are going to start going out. What we have to do is to so spread this message that we start taking evasive action here and now and create an environment in which the next generation are going to be able to think well enough and hard enough to turn these thoughts into reality before the lights begin to dim. Thank you.